Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today in our panel that will be exploring activism in fashion. As we know, fashion and activism go hand in hand, whether that's the way that fashion serves as our second skin, how we proclaim ourselves to the world, or whether that's the politics of fashion, whether that's the labor behind the label or the environmental impact of fashion that is often affecting the most marginalized communities in this world. Beyond that, 2020 was a year that further showed us the political side of fashion. We had everything from COVID-19 to the ongoing fight for racial justice, and fashion became all the more politicized. So for today's panel, we have an amazing set of speakers, and I'm going to let each and every one of them introduce themselves. So to start, um, I could introduce myself. My name is Aditi Meyer, and I'm a sustainable fashion blogger but a journalist and labor rights activist based out of Los Angeles. My work looks at the fashion industry through a lens of intersectionality and decolonization. Um, beyond my work online, I am a journalist and in 2022, I'm really excited to be heading to India for a year um, as a National Geographic Fellow, where I will be spending one year documenting the social and environmental impacts of India's fashion supply chain. And now I will pass the mic to Buki. Hi, I'm really happy to um, have the conversation with you. Um, yeah, so I'm Buki. I'm the founder of the sustainable fashion brand Buki Akumulafe. I studied fashion design here in Berlin and founded my label in 2016. My heritage is um, my father is from Nigeria and my mom's from Germany. So I grew up in between two different worlds. And that was always a topic for me in my life and a topic during my studies. And after finishing my studies, I realized that I want to dive in more and more into this topic, living between two identities and also linking it up together. So I founded my label. And yeah, my work is actually the expression of both identities. And um, yeah, my mission is to build bridges between two different worlds and to have an exchange between them. Thank you, Buki. Um, next, Danny, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, my name is Danny Coyle, aka Intersexy. Um, I am an intersex um, digital artist and um, content creator. Um, all of my work kind of focuses on raising awareness and um, advocating for and empowering and bringing joy to the intersex community, the wider queer community as well, but especially the intersex community because we're so often um, at the bottom of the pile and forgotten about. Um, in fact, so many people don't even know what um, intersex means or that we even exist. Um, so yeah, my work is all about co trying to combat that and um, creating work that's really democratized and um, accessible so that everybody's parents could understand it and get behind it and sort of learn how they can be um, the best intersex ally or queer ally that they can be. Um, and a lot of the time intersex narratives are extremely medicalized. And um, I really, with my work, I really try and put a bit of fun into it, a bit of pop, like just so it isn't so dreary because so many conversations about um, our issues can be so, um, like they're so important, but they're so disheartening sometimes. So my work, I really wanted to show the other side of that and really champion intersex joy. So yeah, that's kind of what my work is about. Amazing. And last but not least, Ariana, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? <clears throat> hey, everyone. I'm so grateful to be part of this talk today. I'm Ariana Pieper, and I'm Berlin-based, and I'm an advocate for fair fashion. I really love fashion, but uh, I never understood how one can enjoy fashion when it's not fairly and ecologically produced, when somebody else has to suffer at the end of the supply chain. So I told myself I want to love and continue love fashion but I want to do better and um, I think knowledge transfer is super important on this topic it's an emotional topic and you have to educate talk to people always um, keep the dialogue going on so my work is on the one hand a lot about education going to schools universities um, but also just giving talks. And um, on the other hand, I'm country coordinator for Fashion Revolution Germany since um, now four years, but I'm part of the founding team here in Germany. 
um, of fashion revolution. And it's, it's a pleasure to be part of this global campaign and see all the work growing year from year and year. And um, I'm super excited to have this year Fashion Open Studio in Berlin in my hometown and see all the designers like Buki and the other ones um, presenting their work, how fair fashion yeah, can be, how beautiful and amazing. Love it. Thank you so much. So one recurring theme that I've seen in your introductions alone is how your work intersects with identity. And we know that fashion intersects with identity, as does activism. So to start, Buki, I'd love to ask you the question. You mentioned your you know, hyphenated identity informs your work. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and how you balance those two worlds um, and how that translates to the work that you create. Yeah, so for me, um, I was like, somehow I always um, felt kind of lost because when I was a teenager, I, um, so my, I spent my childhood in Nigeria and in my teenage years in Germany. And um, I was always, when I'm in Germany, I'm always the black girl and in Nigeria I was always the wild white girl. So I never felt kind of, whole and during my studies when I um, started to work with textile and um, I was connected more and more to my heritage and also linked both heritage together also the way of working because um, I did one internship also in Nigeria and realized how people work totally differently there compared to here in the fashion scene but for me, it was, I felt so comfortable with the way they were working. And um, yeah, it opened up a total new dimension for me. And I realized, okay, I can link both different, like ex kind of extreme different worlds together and yeah, make a fusion. And yeah, that's my language now. And also in my fashion, it's always, my work is... Um, an expression of two kind, different kind of contrasts with texture, also with gender. And yeah, I linked it up together and it's my way to express myself. And it's also helping me in um, forming my identity and supporting others and forming their identity as well. Thank you so much. I think uh, one thing that really spoke to me from that is the idea that fashion can really be a platform to amplify our own personal narratives. And so Danny, what has your relationship been to fashion and how do you think fashion can better champion the narratives and identities of the larger queer community? Um, I think for me, it's been um, like, not not particularly an afterthought like I've always been interested in fashion but um for me it started off as just um like be, not not particularly being a tool to express myself but being a tool to assimilate within um a very cis world um and sort of being very aware of my appearance and this kind of thing I think uh, the one way fashion be can become better for the queer community is just becoming less gendered in general I think we are definitely seeing like big strides towards that but obviously um like whether they are superficial or whether they are actually going to be changing the structures that oppress people um that is going to be like only time will tell um but I really hope that it will have this kind of more lasting change um but yeah as for myself like identity um has like completely grown with being able to talk more freely about um the things that have traditionally brought me shame and I think as I've sort of been able to talk more openly about this kind of thing I've become more adventurous and more um excited about being able to express myself through fashion through beauty through um digital beauty like how I express myself online and like all of the kind of nuances with my identity that I express online and all of the things that that's meant that I've been able to then realize and explore my, myself in real life through my online identities and the amazing people that I get to talk to about it like so yeah, um, I don't know if that answered your question, lots of things, but um, I hope that was um, a similar answer. 
No, most definitely. And I think, you know, the idea of degendering fashion is a conversation that I think needs to be more front and center within the sustainable fashion space, especially because if we think about it, sustainability at its core is about challenging the norm. And we can't just stop at environmental impact or labor, but also how fashion intersects with culture. So for my next question, it's for you, Ariana. And I know that you had previously worked as a consultant for the fashion industry and decided after that experience that you only wanted to work with the projects that spoke to you on an ethical level. So I'd love to know what that shift was like and what you've seen um, in the fashion space from your shift specifically to sustainable fashion. Um, <clears throat> I think it was really um, healing for myself to, to take this decision um, because I've seen how fast the fashion world is also work-wise. We talk a lot about products and the people along the supply chain. And sometimes we forget about the people that uh, work here in the agencies, in the studios, um, in communication areas, um, everyone in the companies. There's also quite a lot of pressure. And I've noticed this pressure in my um, work as a consultant. And I didn't want to be part of it because I, I noticed that it affects me personally and also with my family life and um, I needed more time and then um, lucky me I, I was also part of the fair fashion world and I've noticed that there's a different tone going on it's 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 a different voice people speak differently to each other it's not a an against each other it's on together we want to help each other we want to um, share platforms I've seen this now in the pandemic um, that fair fashion labels are they're growing together. They've noticed that some fair fashion labels, they don't have an online store yet. And it's not like they said like, well, you I have one, you're not. No, it's like, I'm going to invite you to my online store because we want to sell fair fashion. And I don't want to see you um, sink. I want to help you um, grow. And it's, I think this um, voice, this atmosphere is a, is a workspace I want to I live in. I want to be part of. And um, yeah, this helped me. And I think it's also something I want to share now with my work, share it with others and, and also tell the message, you don't have to accept um, the, the area you're, you're working in at the moment. You can change it. Everyone can contribute a little step and everyone can make it a little bit better. I love that, the idea of, collaboration over competition. And I think that's a complete cognitive shift that one goes to between the sustainable fashion industry and the traditional fashion industry, because it's predicated on two very different values. One is about reimagining the world with the values we want to see. And the other is predicated on exponential growth, meeting those financial, um, you know, pinpoints and whatnot. And so we have a lot of different perspectives on this panel. We have a fashion designer, an artist, the fashion revolution coordinator, and I'd be curious to know how COVID-19 affected each and every one of your work. Uh, we've seen everything from fashion coming to a complete halt um, to the nature of freelancing work shifting. So anyone could start, but I'd love to hear how the past year has been for each and every one of you. Um, well, let's start from the campaigning side, maybe. Um, <clears throat> Like um, like everyone, we were faced by the pandemic all of a sudden. It was really, I don't know why we were so blind, but then one from one week to the other end was like, okay, Fashion Revolution Week is coming. It's almost April, but everything we planned was physical, in the streets, demonstrations. And we're like, oh, oh we, can't, we can't do it anymore. What are we doing? And then we had to shift. And I think it took us a week and then we had a new idea and came up with a fake web shop, Crisis Fashion. Um, it's still online, the site, and I invite everyone to check it out because it's a lot of fun and um, I think it tells a big message. Um, and it was nice to see that the team performed so well in this shift. We were, I don't know, I think we had some some tools already going on and it wasn't such a big deal to to use online tools and to communicate like that. We noticed we, yeah, we have these all these modern um, ways of communication, and we can have a fashion revolution campaign going on. And I'm not talking about only the German team. Internationally, I've seen so many beautiful projects 
been set up within a couple of weeks, so flexible and spontaneous. And it was a bit like going back to the roots because Fashion Revolution was a digital campaign in the beginning. We have as a core um, activism to uh, the hashtags who made my clothes. We asked those in the social media channels. So we were like, okay, let's just go back and do it again all over the media and the internet. And it was a lot of fun. And I think we've learned a lot. Amazing. Danny, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, as an as an individual, um, luckily, like I'm a digital designer, so I was very much able to um, maintain um, my freelance schedule but just from home um and if anything i think um personally i got busier because obviously every everything and everybody was shifting online um in terms of like physical activism obviously that took a big hit unfortunately like a lot of the groups that um i was a part of um that met weekly or monthly um we we weren't able to do that anymore and i feel like everybody has really felt that um hit of community like this is what I mean the technology is amazing but it doesn't um completely replace um interacting in real life especially when uh you like your chosen family um especially in the queer world like when your chosen family are often your family and so many people don't um get that acceptance from the people that they live with and then suddenly having to be inside all the time because of covid um it puts a lot of people in very dangerous um spaces and then you obviously don't have the physical connection to to the people you would like to be around so um yeah i mean it's been challenging for everyone like um but i think times like this talks like this it really does um give me hope anyway and i think um activism online is still thriving and um obviously questions arise about how much good like that's actually doing we can't actually get out there and do um what we'd like to do um and help real people people and talk to real people but the reach is exponential and um hopefully um we can still get our messages out there and um change some kind of narrative even if it's uh, on a lesser scale but yeah um covid has been interesting <laughs> i think for everyone i'm sure awesome yeah and i think between you and ariana the idea of online activism and the rise of that is grown exponentially and i think there's a conversation to be had about how do we balance that engagement and education online with concrete action in our daily lives and so i'd love to circle back to that question but first i'd love to hear from buki on how covid has affected your work and practice yeah for me at the beginning um everything really slowed down because everything got cancelled like the fairs trade fairs pop up events and stuff but I also felt kind of a relief because um, I felt like the fact that we all have to slow down raised the awareness um, for sustainable fashion and so after a while I really realized that more and more people got interested in my brand and so actually for me and my brand it was a quite quite of a good year last year and um I guess one fact it was the COVID-19, but also um, the debate um, of the racial injustice in this world, because after uh, last summer, I really felt a big shift and like people got more and more um, into my brand and a lot of requests and um, interest. So yeah, I mean, it was really strange for me because the incidents were really bad that like COVID is insane and also um, the racial, racial injustice. But for me as a brand, um, it was quite good at the end. And um, the fact that these kind of things needs to happen, that people change their minds and like we see a small or a shift that is getting more and more um, yeah, I think the fact is sad, but I'm also really happy that there's more awareness about racial injustice, about sustainability and all these topics. So I think it's good in a way. 
Yeah, most definitely. I echo that sentiment. I think 2020 was such a strange year, um, especially for myself as well, because my work has always explored fashion through a lens of racial justice and social justice. And to suddenly, you know, have your platform grow, my audience probably doubled in the last year, but in the face of trauma and pain for so many, um, it's definitely a double-edged sword because you always want folks to pay attention. It's a conversation that we've been having for years. Um, but sometimes, it, you know, it's this strange feeling of how do we reconcile that and how do we make sure that the attention that is, you know, now being granted and all these new folks are actually in it for the long haul. And so I guess that could be a nice transition to a question around performative activism. You know, in the age of online activism, I feel like we really need to embrace these tools at our disposal amid a pandemic. Um, but there's always been, and there's been a rise of kind of the cynicism of, is it authentic? And so Ariana and Danny, because a lot of your work is in this online space, how do you kind of reconcile education and spreading awareness, but making sure it translates to concrete action, policy, changed mind and hearts, whatever that might be. Um, I feel like that is a question I ask myself daily um, and I'm still trying to figure out the answer of how I can best do that myself, um, specifically within the intersex community, because um, they're like, we're not rare, but there, there aren't so many of us sort of like taking uh, a very um, vocal role, it's very difficult to sort of have a big enough group to really mobilize in real life. So this is where um, kind of online digital tools have been incredible because we're all so spread out all over the world. And this way we actually get to create some kind of change, um, whatever that might be. But yeah, it's so difficult. I tend to like, I really do try that if I ever do any kind of like educational post, I really ask people to take this offline and sort of like you tell one and ask that person to tell one and that kind of sort of like chain effect. Um, otherwise, yeah, I think it's all just completely down to us. Like it's that kind of honor code that you just have to make sure that you're doing the work when the spotlight isn't on or like the, when the camera isn't on and only you can hold yourself to that. So um, hopefully, and I think this year, like everyone said, for, for many people who work digitally, it's been um, quite a good year, um, like in, in terms of work-wise, but then obviously, um, it, that is that way for us because we're like in a very privileged position and just making sure that um, you're then trying to transfer some of that privilege onto the people who aren't in in, in that position um, and yeah just like trying to figure it figure it out day by day I mean nobody's perfect and um, um, just waking up and trying to do the best you can every day yeah <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree with that sentiment. Um, you know, no one knows what happens behind social media. And I think there is not a need to amplify every single thing, um, but to hold ourselves and those around us accountable. Ariana, how has it been on fashion revolutions end? Um, definitely difficult as well. I mean, it's, it's so hard to really um, build a relationship between this online campaign that is mostly happening on channels like Instagram where young people are just scrolling through and um, you have no idea who's on the other end and what is the emotion um, that you're awaking with some pictures. Um, so um, we try our best to set impulses, to um, send us messages and um um, also educate on the varieties of topics of uh, fashion. Um, and I think this year was, uh, it was, um, or last year, it was definitely most challenging um, to, to tell the story of the people that are not as privileged as we are. Because like I said before, we as a team, we haven't had a very big difficulty to keep things going. But I mean, we have our contacts, and we uh, we knew what was going on in the production countries. There are a lot of people suffering under the pandemic, and they are suffering due to um, corrupt uh, governments or to um, low infrastructure. But they're also suffering because of the problems that are in the fashion industry 
for years. I'm talking, for example, about living wages. They are not paid. So people had no chance to put savings beside. And when the pandemic happened, they were fired from one week to the other. And we here in a country like Germany have a social network, but people in production countries often haven't. And um, there's no savings. So what do you do when you have no job from one week to the other? You have no saving because your, um, your factory never paid you a living wage. It's a devastating um, situation. It's catastrophical. And um, we wanted to tell the story, but we didn't want to push people too fast away. So um, it's definitely difficult to find a balance in our work. I think that's why we uh, were quite happy with our idea about a fake web shop, because on the first hand, it shows a usual, regular, fast fashion shop. And I think we were attract, uh, attracting a lot of people, shoppers, to just click on the website. And then when you um, try to purchase something, then you notice, oh, no, this purchase isn't a real purchase. It's about educating, about knowledge transfer and about what really happens in the fashion industry. So we try to do this in an entertaining way. And um, I personally believe this is also um, a great a great tool of fashion revolution to be a little bit entertaining, but never lose the message. Um, and I also do a lot of um, online courses now with universities. And it's, I think there I try to be personal, tell the stories of ups and downs in this work area. They only see me as country coordinator of fashion revolution. I think like, ooh, this is really great. And like, yay. It's not that great because we are not yet paid all because it's um, um, uh, voluntarily work we are doing since years. It's quite a difficult job. And um, I think it's important to be honest at some point to tell, these, to tell young people, students sometimes uh, what, what is behind this beautiful picture. And uh, I have a lot of discussions with them there. And um, I think when you have the opportunity to talk to somebody one by one, then then is the best chance to really push them into a new direction and make a change inside. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of vulnerability and just more authenticity. I feel like 2020 was the year of many things, as I've said, but it's also been the year where I think we've embraced that more holistically as a society. Um, so I'd be curious to know, we could start with you, Buki, what have been the challenges of being a sustainable fashion designer, a designer of color thus far, um, whether pre-pandemic and so whether it's related to COVID or be before that, what have been those issues for you? For me, um, at the beginning, especially as a designer of color in Germany, I felt quite alone because there weren't that many when I started. So, yeah, it was really hard because I was kind of invisible and um, it was really hard to get out there and be confident and show my work. Also, the fact that I'm also using the so-called African wax prints and um, in Germany five years ago, African fashion what not, was not that... Um, yeah, it was not an interest for the German market. So it was quite hard for me to enter the market, to do what I do and show my work. And during the last years, it got more and more in interest. And also um, I met Beatrice. She's uh, the founder of a platform fashion, fashion Africa now here in Germany. And she organized an event, I think three years ago, where she connected designers of the diaspora and also designers from the continent. And she brought us all together to Hamburg and we had an event together. And that was actually the first time when I felt empowered and I felt kind of home in the fashion scene. And this really helped me yeah, to grow, to grow in confidence and um, to also keep my work and keep on being motivated and through the exchange and meeting all the other designers with kind of the same problems and issues. Um, yeah, it was really great to connect and work 
also exchange and work together. I love that the power of community, right? Especially as a person of diaspora, you know, we wear our, our identity so proudly and it's such a big part of who we are and the work we produce. But sometimes when you are living in predominantly white spaces, you're either tokenized or they try to pigeonhole you with that. And so it's really great to see the way you've kind of honed in on your identity and expanded that chain at Germany's fashion lives, um, and the worldwide fashion scene as well. So you do. Danny, I'd love to hear from you on what those challenges have been throughout the past few years as an intersex activist. I mean, generally, the biggest challenge um, being in sex is just that nobody knows um, what that means. So generally, it's really difficult to have a conversation about something that nobody knows exists or knows what, what it means. Um, also, there's so much shame and stigma about being in sex. Um, so generally, most of the people who are, or a lot of people who are, just genuinely just don't have the confidence to, um, or, or, I don't know if it's the confidence, but like don't have the will to sort of um, come out and deal with um, the backlash from society. Um, generally though, like since coming out, I, it's been an incredible roller coaster. Like I only came out like a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And since then, like I have done so much incredible work with such incredible people. Um, and it's been really incredible. And so much of it, has been um, with fashion brands and um, some of the stuff that I'm most proud about um, has been with fashion brands. So they've been really open. But again, in, a, in the same way, like sometimes it feel, can feel quite tokenizing. Like I've had people um, message me sort of being like, oh, we need an I. Like we've got the LGBTQ, so we need an I. And it's a bit like, okay, cool. Like, And you're on set and obviously everybody doesn't know like what you're there for. Everyone's sort of tiptoeing around like what pronouns to use. Like there's only male and female bathrooms. Like, so at the same time, like obviously getting booked for work is incredible, but you have to really look a bit deeper and think, okay, well, I I'm sort of being the face of your brand here. And actually, is this just surface level? Um, you obviously don't have any, any um, like depth to this. Um, kind of thought um so yeah that can be challenging but then also like after this year I feel so much more confident in being able to like pull them up on that and say um oh I had it like thank you so much for booking me but these are the issues that I found with this shoe and like for me it was an insulting but if you had booked um a trans a, a different insect person or a different trans person um this would have been an issue and it could have been really uncomfortable and like we can't have this going forward so I think after this year it's been um quite empowering to um sort of it's much easier for a keyboard I find as well <laughs> like doing it through an email is so much nicer than having to do it to someone's face so I find yeah that's that kind of separation has been really great um yeah they're kind of the main issues that I've found um in the fashion industry so far but I'm a newbie still so we'll see I'm sure there's some to come <laughs> I love that and the power of a good follow-up email I think that's so important yeah. as <laughs> as we get these opportunities and you know there's always this weird line of is this tokenization or is this authentic representation is we're taking you know our communities with us so asking casting directors or pitching other folks names and just making sure that we're focusing on horizontal collaboration and community um, so we're not just the token south asian or you know the token intersex activist on set um, Ariana, how has it been for the past few years, you alluded to some of the challenges of being a coordinator, but what else have been the issues that you've struggled with? Um, I think the main issue is to, to keep the team motivated. We are all driven by the idea of um, improving working conditions in, in the fashion industry and um, telling about the problems but we all have um not only one job we have a couple of jobs to make our living our money jobs and um yeah we we have a team of maybe let's say 10 and um here in berlin and um yeah it's quite a challenge to to keep the people motivated um especially around april because we got a lot of work around um fashion revolution day or week but when it's done, um, I think we have all a very 
warm heart and we're like yes we did it again and it's so much fun to to see um the community grow um and we want to we want a network to grow so uh, we want to don't have to have only a group in berlin we want to have a um a network um, all over germany and now we have a lot of uh, regional groups city groups and um they spread the message of fashion revolution in every corner of germany now and i think it's time to grow the network globally stronger we have seen a couple of us have seen each other in real life but mostly we know each other only from calls and um we haven't met yet and i think the next challenge will be to have the global network grow even stronger together and also exchange the different perspectives because i have a perspective of a german country coordinator which is completely different from a perspective of a country coordinator in um, production countries and i think it's super important to um work closer together so um, we can exchange those ideas and identities um and this is a challenge but i see a very big opportunity in it and fashion revolution is the best platform i can think of to realize it mm -hmm. and i think always questioning who's missing from the table right i think in fashion and especially sustainable fashion we've seen you know years in the making this very disproportionate power structure where it's voices from the western world that are often leading these dialogues when it's folks from other countries that are being disproportionately affected and so whose behalf are we speaking at how are we actively you know giving voice and giving power more importantly so hope to see that translate in the future all of you embed activism as a part of the work that you do And I think, you know, a sentiment that I've seen a lot online, especially is, well, how do I start being an activist? So I'd love to hear from each and every one of you. And Buki could start of how you would tell someone how they could get involved within the sphere of activism. I think you can really start small. Um, for example, if you want to start with fashion, I would like what I, I also give workshops at schools and that's also the question the children always ask me and um yeah i give them different kind of um possibilities how they can um question their consumer behavior because i think that's also one big part in the fashion especially in the fast fashion scene where you can yeah have a small start and change it so um i would suggest to buy less buy products with a better quality and of course the use they don't have that much money so i tell them you can buy second hand or go to swap events and swap clothes with your friends and um so that's one of the smalls and first steps you can do and then of course as ariana said um get involved in fashion revolution or in different kind of um communities and platforms and yeah so That's the first steps I would suggest to other people. Amazing. And Danny, what would you say are some of the tips or ideas you would share for folks that want to be a better ally to the intersex and larger queer community? Um, I think just like kind of points that we've covered um, already, just um, if, if, you, um, if you've got a stage or a platform or a microphone, just pass it on to somebody who um, can use it. Um, really listen to what um, these people are telling you because so much of the time um, people want to help but they just don't want to listen so they kind of like help you in a way they think they would want help or they help you in a way or they do things that they think will be helpful but actually they they can talk over you or they can um, they can sort of take over and actually so much of the time it's just about listening um, I think, um, yeah, I think those are two really like um, easy things that you can do on the daily. Um, yeah, and just um, going back to your previous question to Buki, it was just um, like starting small as well. So talking to family members, often that is like the absolute, the most challenging thing that you can possibly do. So already you're probably taking it, like it's so much easier for me to post a post on Instagram 
and sort of like choose whether I look at the comments, but having a direct conversation with um, family members that potentially disagree with you is going to be so much more challenging and um, um, has the potential to be so much more rewarding. So yeah, starting with friends and family and um, using like tools like um, Instagram or whatever um, to publish like that's the great thing about this is democratized activism completely like anybody can publish anything or not anything like if your work is maybe not going to be like submitted on these like new censorship rules but there are other platforms that you can use um but yeah generally just start, start small and just start doing because often um you can get so caught up in your head um and the best thing to do is just start doing and um, learn from your mistakes yeah. Love that. Love the idea um, that you also noted about divesting from the savior complex. Um, I think that's something we can leave behind as a community of activists is no one needs to be saved. We need to kind of interrogate the conditions that make it so they lack voice um, in our current society. Ariana, how about you? How would you say folks can get involved, whether that's with fashion revolution specifically or just being a consumer activist in general? Hmm. Um, it's interesting when I uh, give lectures on specific topic topics, sometimes very technical. Um, and then in the end, it's it's kind of always the one question: How can I change my consumption behavior? You know, you can talk about a lot of very technical topics, and in the end, it's about consumption. Then they have no idea. Very often, it's like, yeah, but where do I shop? And what are the regulations or which certificate is trustworthy? Um, so in the end, it's all about yeah consumption. How can I change my individual consumption behavior? And um, there I would start with talking about it. Go to your friends, ask them how they shop. And if they now have an idea where um, a shop is that sells locally, fairly produced ecological clothes. Um, and don't be shy. Be honest in those talks. and um, tell the doubts but also give ideas um i think it's super important to to continuously talk about it with family of course but also with friends and uh and keep doing it and start small if you want to change from one day to the other with a, on a hundred percent you will fail for, for sure and then you're frustrated and to get out of frustration again is so difficult i think everybody knows it so i always tell everyone start step by step and um maybe look at your wardrobe and check if you really need this new clothing you have in mind or maybe you have it in a different color already in your wardrobe and this is already the first step less consumption and this can easily be done by conscious consumption. But in the end, what I want is this individual change, of course, but I also tell we need an um, institutional change because the individual change is important, but the impact is unfortunately quite small. So we need the industry to change. We need politicians um, to provide laws and um, for this we need the power of the people of everyone and um, so I ask students for example to um, have actions at universities um, buy merchandise only fairly produced go to the universities those are easy things and I think everyone has an opportunity um, to change something easily but we need to start and we need to start honestly yesterday so it's really time to do something i love that you brought that up because that was my next question i feel like a lot of the narrative around changing the industry focuses too much on the consumer and that's not to undermine the you know power of conscious consumerism or not consuming but again as you said we need to kind of acknowledge the beast <laughs> that is the industry so Buki and Danny I'd love to hear from your perspectives how do you think we can change the industry from the fashion perspective or the production perspective I and Buki think, you could start uh, if you'd like yeah <laughs> I think um oh. yeah for me personally um yeah, I want to be an example, of course, but as I'm still a small brand, I, I know that I don't have this kind of big impact. And I think, um, as Ariane said, what is really important um, is that there needs to be some laws that the big companies 
yeah it needs we need some restrictions and more and more transparency to know what's happening in the whole supply chain because that's one of the main problems and all the small labels we really try and we do what we can but it's important on a big on the bigger level that this needs to be regulated and in my opinion i think um it's only possible with laws because it would be lovely if the big companies would do it by themselves but as long as they only look after their profit they won't so yeah we need laws totally yeah i completely agree i think um like the kind of people um that i engage with online and sort of are within my community um the world was not built by them or for them and um neither was the industry so i mean it's it's a nice idea that we can sort of um like i think we need to demand change from higher up and like you said sort of demand that the laws be changed that policy be in place like um be put through um which um limits the damaging actions of those who do have the power because like Buki said like it isn't small brands it's not like queer kids in the suburbs like do you know what I mean it's like it's not them at all so um I think just um it's so difficult though because often the people in government are those um who we're asking to control and obviously that's not in their self-interest so I think then this is when coming back to on a smaller scale um like sort of grassroots things and using your smaller um, digital platform to call for that change um however you can um yeah I love that. Um, so we talked a lot about the issues of the current fashion landscape, especially within the last year. But I think a key part of activism and being an activist is having the ability to reimagine what the future and present can look like. So I'd love to go around each of you and Ariana, you could start this time. And I'd love to hear what you imagine for the future of fashion if you were to make things operate your way. <laughs> oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> well, I'm super curious how the future will be, especially also for the campaign of Fashion Revolution, because I believe we, we just started and um, we need to have this to, to grow the campaign bigger and bigger. Um, what I'd love to see is that we can provide an even bigger and louder platform for all the beautiful fashion designers out there, because there's so, such an amazing repertoire of of design and creativity that is not yet seen. It's all about the big chains, um, but the beautiful small designers that are hidden in the alleys of Germany and Berlin, that are not yet out um, in the mainstream. And I would love to see that Fashion Revolution can provide, maybe with Fashion Open Studio, a platform um, to those designers, to the diversity of the design and that also people that are not yet interested in those that kind of fashion that they are opening their heart and try something differently for the first time and discover that it's much more fun to buy a clothing that might be a little bit more expensive but then you can still tell the story of this clothing and i think this is definitely worth the bigger price thank you danny i'd love to hear from you next um, I think for me, it's completely about making sure that we see more like diversity in the sort of narratives and bodies and um, identities that we see, not just in the campaigns on the face of the company, but um, like I, I want these people being the ones like um, organizing the teams. Um, I'd love to like turn up on set one day and have like a whole team of people, like, do you know what I mean? It's not just the talent who's... Um, that like the kind of odd one out here it's like the whole team um and there are people in um sort of positions of power um so that would be incredible also just making sure that um the, the kind of positions um at the at the sort of bottom of the food chain are being paid for to make sure that kids from um like working class families can afford to get into the industry um because for so long like i'm very lucky where i could work for free or or for the price of a uban ticket or um the london tube ticket but uh, uh, so many people can't and then i feel like that has completely all of all of the opportunity that i've got 
in my life has has been from being able to work for free um, for a year um, when I was coming out of uni. And so many people don't have that luxury. So just making sure that, um, yeah, these kind of jobs like internships and assistant jobs and all this kind of thing um, are regulated because the amount of hours that uh, are put on these people is insane, but also paid fairly. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think the conversation around compensation is so important to have. And it goes back to the other conversation of the diversity and inclusion of who gets to speak on behalf of these spaces. Because if you don't come from economic privilege, you know, you're going to be limited in the amount of non-paid work or internships you're able to take on. So I'm really glad you bring that up. Um, I also love the idea of going beyond just billboards, but also boardrooms and everything beyond that and internal to a company. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been on set where it's a very inclusive cast, all talent, you know, is BIPOC and the whole crew is white. <laughs> and so that's something I hope that we can shift going forward as well. Um, Buki, what do you reimagine for the future of fashion? Yeah, for me also, I imagine like a big diversity of teams, of um, campaigns, of people in the higher positions. And also, um, for me, it's also very important that the global north and the global south, so that it's in a balance and we're all on a quick equal level um, regarding trade, regarding how we communicate, how we work together. And how we use our voices and how who has the voice. So that's really important for me and yeah, my bigger vision. I love that. And I think that conversation around the global north and global south naturally lends itself to having us look at the histories of colonialism and imperialism and how that affects how the modern fashion industry operates. So I'm glad we were able to conclude on that for the future of fashion. Um, to close, thank you all so much for taking the time to participate. Can we each go around and tell everyone where we can find you online and how we can support you? And Buki, we could start with you. Yeah, you find me on Instagram. It's uh, Buki Akumalafe. And also on my website, it's www.bukiakumalafe.com. And there you also find the link to the online shop. And if you're in Berlin, I have a studio and showroom here in Kreuzberg. Amazing. Danny, how can we support you and find you on the interwebs? Um, so my, I love that, the interweb. I, oh, wait, no, <laughs> internet anyway. I was going to say you've done like a really punny thing there, but actually it's got the word in it anyway. Um, but no, you can find me on Instagram at, at inter underscore sexy. Um, and I definitely need to diversify some platforms. So, um, yeah, that's all I'm kind of on at the moment, but hopefully in the future, I will be more places online. Um, and yeah, just, um, the way you can help me really is just getting the word out there. Um, please don't message me, um, questions that I've already answered, um, and, um, sort of use the content that I've already made because it can be so disheartening when you spend so long making content and then everybody messages you like the same question and it, it, it's really disheartening. So yeah, just, uh, use the content that I've made, share it, like it, um, talk to your parents about what intersex means, talk to your friends, like, if um if if like one if you tell somebody and they tell someone it's a ripple effect and um it will make big a big difference awesome and ariana where can oh, sorry adrian i'm so sorry where can we find your work online and how can we get involved um you can best find us on instagram for example or fresh red um, underline DE for the German um, team or FeshRef for the global team. And um, our German activities are also um, displayed on future.fashion, our website. And um, of course, fashionrevolution.org. Um, depending where you are, we'll definitely find a, a national group or regional group. And um, sure that um, everybody's happy when someone someone raises the hand and says I want to contribute my time how can I do this and uh, if you want to do it from home just keep asking the simple question who made my clothes um, it's always 
around this question at Fashion Revolution. It's a simple question, but it has a, a lot of meaning and uh, spread the message that we need answer to this question. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. And thank you for everyone joining us. You can find a replay of this panel on the Fashion Revolution YouTube channel, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and please follow all of our amazing speakers. They're doing great work to reimagine what fashion can be doing and what it should be doing. So thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.